Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, on behalf of Regen Brisbane and uh, QSEC, welcome to our the first in four workshops, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so we've got a little blurb there about Regen Brisbane, and we're inviting everyone to join our growing network of lovely human beings and organisations exploring how to make Brisbane a regenerative city. I'd like to acknowledge country. We're all here in Brisbane, living, working and playing on the traditional lands of the Yagara and Turrbal peoples. I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the remarkable governance system and um, culture that was able to care for country and care for one another since time immemorial. Um, many folks may have seen this photo. I share this whenever I acknowledge country. These are the beautiful water lilies in the nearby Nudgee waterholes where I live. So perhaps um, take a little moment right in this moment to think about where you live, work and play, whose traditional lands um, you uh, are lucky enough to live on and which plants and animals um, are your neighbours. And particularly for those who are with us who are in Brisbane, Regen Brisbane, um, have a think about the things within Brisbane that you love, the places you go to walk, the things that you enjoy. Um, and as anyone knows, I always encourage you to think about the little, the little buzzy bees, the insects, the butterflies, the creatures, the possums, all the things that you live and work and play with. So today is the first um, of a slow, slow and easy start in winter into some really, um, we're hoping some remarkable discussions. So this is the little graphic that we've been using to um, remind folks that we've got four workshops. We've got kicking off today, the 8th of July, and then we have another one on the 29th of July, the 19th of August and the 2nd of September. And for those who've read a little bit about what we're up to, um, you'll know the, the main plan. But what I'd like to do is I'll introduce myself and some of our team members, and then I'll give you a quick run through of what our plans are for the four workshops. Um, I'll invite Elise to talk quickly about QSEC, and then we'll hone in on what we're aiming to discuss today. So firstly, I, I'm Michelle Maloney. I'm the co-founder and national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. I'm also really proud to be one of the directors of the New Economy Network Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge, I can see Neil Taylor, who's now a, a new uh, volunteer director of NINA. And NINA is actually hosting um, some of the web information about the many regenerative towns and cities uh, movement that's starting to be uh, happening. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Elise Parrop, who will talk to you in a moment from the Queensland Social Enterprise Council. And um, I have several AILA colleagues here. Hello, Elise. <laughs> Um, and I've got several AILA colleagues, including the wonderful Kira, who's in the in the room there at the uh, Brisbane Business Hub, and James Lee. Hello, James. And uh, Kira and James will be helping. Uh, Kira will be helping in the room today. James and I will be on deck to help online. And I also see the wonderful Sarah Bashford, who helps with many other things too. So that's my introduction. Um, I think I might now just introduce the Regen Cities movement a little bit to you all, just to give you a little bit of context for what we're up to. Then I'll talk a little bit about Regen Brisbane, then hand over to Elise to talk about QSEC. So um, this sort of Regen Brisbane is riding on the wave of some really cool work that was done a couple of years ago, actually when COVID lockdowns started in, in intensity across Australia. And we encourage you to have a look at the work of Regen Melbourne. Um, they've been using donut economics, which we can talk about later today if we wish, um, to really bring people together to talk about what a regenerative Melbourne might look like. Uh, in the two and a half years since they've been doing um, some of their work, they've produced um, a report showing people's intentions and vision for the place. Um, and they've now got a number of people across different organisations looking at what regenerative Melbourne might look like in terms of um, its future plans. Um, I think we were next. I think I grabbed the idea of Regen Melbourne and thought, wouldn't that be fun to apply some of the work that we're all doing across really amazing uh, different directions here in Brisbane and actually connect into this sort of regenerative movement. And Regen Sydney around the same time, um, and they've now got a new website and they've just developed a little report on some of their gatherings and the things that they're talking about. And if you're interested in all of this, do Google them. And um, I'll give you later, uh, we've got one web page on the NINA website, which also points you to the different um, initiatives. Region Adelaide is very new. Uh, I think it's got a web presence. 
And Regenerative Songlines Australia has emerged from a very different place, but I wanted to give it a plug because it's a really amazing group of Indigenous leaders. Uh, Ayla is um, very fortunate. We feel very privileged to be supporting uh, Regen Songlines and Future Dreaming, particularly through some of our secretariat support. Regenerative Songlines Australia has people like Anne Polina, Mary Graham, Tyson Yonker Porter, Charles Marshall, uh, Ross Williams, many other excellent Indigenous thinkers and leaders um, really designing processes to help people understand how Aboriginal people have cared for country since time immemorial, but also what kind of um, Indigenous knowledge systems can be useful for uh, non-Indigenous people and appropriate to learn from um, and to connect with. So it's got its own website. Um, if uh, any of the Aylerites can find it, maybe pop that in the chat and share it with folks in the group another way. But I really wanted to just mention that Regen Brisbane is part of, I guess it's like a rethinking of some of the transition towns work, some of the resilience towns work, um, and people really thinking about moving beyond sustainability, thinking about how do we perpetuate life and have a really truly regenerative system. But in a city, the big issue too is how do we become what the term is now, nature positive? How do we not just become uh, carbon neutral or damage neutral, uh, which we haven't even achieved yet, but how can we actually turn our cities into places that are abundant in life and are supporting our living ecosystems as well as social justice and the people around us. With Regen Brisbane, we had a really cool kickoff event last year. Uh, if you haven't seen that, we recorded the day and the day is really built on the Green Prince approach, which we can tell you a bit more about later. Um, the Green Prince approach designed by Ayla um, is something that a lot of different communities and groups, schools, resilience town projects are starting to pick up on as a way of looking at country first and how do we make sure that what we're doing in a place is suitable regenerative and appropriate to place whilst also bringing everyone with us in terms of social justice. Now, these workshops are also gonna to connect to Donut Economics and there's a city portrait framework um, that we'll probably talk a lot more about next workshop. Um, today, we've got a particular focus on really, it's, uh, it's really lovely and it's a credit to Elise for making sure we did this one first, thinking about culture and thinking about how we work together before we start delving into um, some of the core topics around environment, economy, society, et cetera. So Regen Brisbane, um, we've got a lovely website. I should have put it there. I'm sure you know where it is if you've signed up to be part of today's discussions. Um, but if you do have a little look back, you'll see a video of our launch event. Um, and since that launch event, we had a number of online discussions. Uh, COVID was still coming and going and we were being very cautious. Um, and today represents, I think, the first time we've all gotten, some folks are getting together in person. And uh, our next coming workshops we expect will be even bigger because people have a lot more time to, to plan and come along. Okay, so before I talk about um, our program for today, I just wanted to um, hand over to Elise. Perhaps she'd like to introduce herself um, and also introduce um, QSEC and um, some of the wonderful things that they're doing, particularly around the Olympics and the very awesome Olympics webinar we had a little while ago. So, um, Elise, I can see you there under Kira's name, and you may just have to unmute yourself. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for that great introduction um, there, Michelle. And welcome to everybody. I just want to also um, pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging on the grounds that I stand on today, which is the Yagara and Turrbal um, People's Country. And at QSEC, we actually believe that um, the First Nations principles and values that have been established over eons of practicing um, uh, business and trade and their own cultures, uh, we have a lot to learn about reciprocity, about respect, about resilience. And this today is NAIDOC week. And in Musgrove Park on this country today, many Indigenous folk are meeting mm -hmm. in Musgrove Park and sharing their cultures, sharing their stories and getting to, to um, stand up together get up, stand up, stay up, and um, really power through. Um, and we're very uh, um, uh, grateful to have those connections with Indigenous businesses through social enterprise as well. So QSEC um, uh, was founded in 2013 and is really around businesses who want to make an impact beyond just doing business as usual. Um, so we are a representative of about 250 social enterprises across Queensland now. 
And in the lead up to the Social Enterprise World Forum, which happens on the 28th and 29th of September this year, um, we're running these four sessions to really help us to um, put, lay down some cornerstones for how we want to build a regenerative future together. So looking at business as a, as a way of actually investing and reinvesting our social capital back into where we live and where we work and where we play. So um, we, we see that social enterprise has a lot to contribute in this space. Um, we're one of the moving parts in the very big cogs and wheels that go um, through planning and creating cities and spaces to live. And we're really excited to be working a lot on uh, our regional communities in the next year and a, a bit next to the Queensland government. We'll be actually activating a lot of social enterprises in each regional town and getting their voices on the table as well. So if you wanna check out more about the Queensland Social Enterprise Council, QSEC, I'm gonna urge you to go to our website too, which is um, qsec.org.au um, and join our movement for change. Um, we're certainly very interested in this conversation. So as we look at the Olympics and 2032, how do we wanna approach um, a, a society which is fair and just? How do we want to have the Olympics, not just as the end point, how do we want it to be a platform that we move toward and beyond and look toward a future that is really gonna be able to be sustained um, in the most um, regenerative way possible. Um, so we're really delighted to have a couple of our speakers um, along here today. Um, so after he hearing from Mary Graham, you'll hear from um, some of our uh, uh, amazing founders in the space. Uh, we've got Robert Pekin, who um, has been a, a terrific support for Queensland Social Enterprises uh, and his communities from Food Connect. We've got um, Richard Warner and Michael Cherry from uh, Nanda Co-op, who were one of our first and founding um, uh, social enterprises in Queensland, and we're very proudly working with them. And we've got the wonderful Saba Abraham, who runs the Moose um, restaurant here in Brisbane in West End, who is also um, an Australian of the Year recipient, a, a local hero, our local hero. <laughs> and we're so delighted to have Saba Abraham, who is also one of the founders of QSEC here with us today too. Um, so um, we're going to have a look at um, culture today. This is something that's really, really, really important to me um, uh, personally. I think it's the, one of the most important things that get missed when we talk about quadruple bottom lines or we actually, most people talk about triple bottom lines. I always add in the fourth, which is culture for me. And it's the first for me because it sets about how we actually work together how we actually bring our values and our shared and common goals together and make sure that we're actually building on a commonality, not having the, the, the differences of our cultures divide us, having the similarities and the commonalities unite us, presenting for us an opportunity to unite and go together and walk together. So um, I'm super excited about this particular session. Um, and Michelle, I'm going to throw it back to you in, in the fullness of time so we can get as much conversation as we can from our wonderful speakers. And um, I'm looking forward to the wonderful Regen Brisbane work that will follow from this conversation. So after the Social Enterprise World Forum, we're going to be deepening this conversation and really enriching what we've learned here today. Thank you, Elise. And I apologise if you got stuck with my big face on your screen there in the real world. Um, just remember that you can control your vision at your end of the screen. Um, so you might like to put that on gallery. It's a good reminder for everyone. Uh, we pin our speakers, but um, when you go up into your little corner, the right hand corner on the black Zoom screen, you can see view. Um, normally, if you just choose gallery or speaker, that should be able to get you what you need. Um, but right now, I'm back on anyway, so. But thank you, Elise. Yeah, we're really excited. Um, Kira, myself and James, we're, we're trying to make enough time to start to reignite the regen processes when um, Elise connected and we've been able to uh, really work together to think about these workshops as a good foundation to start thinking about the future. And then next year, as Elise mentioned, we plan to have um, some much more in-depth and lots of lead time so people can book in the days to come together and uh, work on these initial ideas and actually do the green prints process, which is thinking about um, where our beautiful city is located, 
the bioregion that we all live within, um, right down into the history of our city, what the city uses, what the city produces, both the good stuff and the bad stuff, um, and how we can literally create scenarios that show how the city can be more regenerative, more nature positive, and more resilient to the coming changes with climate change. So it's gonna be a really fun process. Um, and people like Kira, um, who's been part of the Belimba Creek catchment group, um, and people like um, uh, Elise, who are connected to the business community, bring so many different networks already. So we encourage you all to, to join up, sign up, get involved. Um, and what I might do is just quickly show you all the beautiful website for Regen Brisbane so that I can actually show you where things are. Um, and then if, um, I don't think Mary has joined us yet, but we'll see if she's joined us by the 10.30, we'll kick off with Mary. Um, otherwise we can rearrange our speaker order too, to just hear people's stories and ideas. So I'll just share screen quickly. So hopefully you can all see um, the very beautiful Regen Brisbane website. And one of the reasons I wanted to just quickly show it to you is um, under here in the events button. So first of all, the when you come down, you see the beautiful river. Thank you so much to James Lee for his awesome uh, design. We've got the beginnings of our events program and the 2032 Olympics are obviously going to be a huge focus for us. We know that our city um, is scheduled for some changes, basically, um, and if we can all raise our voices and be part of that. Um, one thing I'll show you in a minute is where to find the recording from our um, very first community forum on the Olympics and the processes being used at the moment to plan and make decisions about things. Um, we had uh, a really excellent discussion. I would encourage you to come and listen to that recording and join future discussions. Um, there's a little bit of info about donut economics and the Green Prince approach, which is this step-by-step um, -step way of understanding how to think about our human settlements inside country and how to actually redesign them so they're more sympathetic to a healthy ecosystem and healthy future. And so in the events page, just struggling with my buttons, there we go. You will see in there anything that's upcoming, including all of our workshops, but also you'll be able to watch the recording for the Olympics forum that we had with the wonderful Amy McMahon and Jonathan Shree and Elise and myself and Kira. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, the, the launch event for Regen Brisbane is really helpful because it's got a number of amazing speakers, including Professor Will Steffen talking about planetary boundaries. Uh, we had Kai Lofgren talking about the work they've done with donut economics in Melbourne. Um, and we're kind of feeding it through a process to show what's possible to explore here in Brisbane. Um, I'll just stop sharing that one. But the only other thing I wanted to mention before I run us through the day um, is the web page that we're developing up right now to help people see what's going on across the regenerative towns and cities movements. So I might just um, go back to this. Can you see the new economy website? Sometimes my screen share is, you can see that? Oh, excellent. So this is the NINA website, New Economy Network Australia. And the reason I wanted to mention it is when you come down here, you see a banner that shows cool things like Regen Sydney, Regen Brisbane, Melbourne, Regenerative Songlines. If you click on that banner, eventually you'll have all the news from all of the cool things going on around Australia and the world. Right now, it's pointing you at least to the websites of these different initiatives. So that's enough of that show and tell. And now I just want to run us through what our plans are for the day. And then we'll go to our panel discussion. So I'm doing a lot of flicking around here, aren't I? All right, so we we're just talking about Regen Brisbane and now I just wanna run you through our program. So our welcome in, in introduction um, and in a moment we'll um, hand over to the panel discussion. Um, Mary Graham will be joining us online um, and as Elise said, we also have Robert Pekin, Richard Warner and Sabah Abraham. And um, the plan will be to have about 15 minutes from each of our speakers. And then that will still allow um, hopefully some time for Q&A. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of a break. And for those who are in the room, there'll be a little bit of catering, I understand. And for everyone at home, we can duck off and make a cup of tea. 
Um, and then the good stuff really is where we ask you to share your ideas um, as well as um, being stimulated by our wonderful speakers. Um, so what we're going to ask people to discuss um, the big question for today, as Elise has already mentioned, is what might a vision for diverse and inclusive cultures look like in a regenerative Brisbane? And the questions that we'll ask you to chat about in your little groups and pop down some ideas on butcher's paper, or if you're online, um, we've got a, a shared document that we'll be able to all use online. Um, what does culture even mean to us, given that we all, many of us come from different places? What does a diverse, strong and vibrant culture look like for the city of Brisbane? And when we go a little bit deeper, how do we set principles and frameworks and protocols for working together not just across our workshops, um, but to develop this deeper relationship into our city and into our place. So that will give us time. That's about an hour and a half um, for addressing different topics. And uh, we'll, we'll talk you through all of that. Then we'll have a bit of a chat about what we discovered from each other and we'll be wrapping it up. So that's about it from me in terms of intros. Let me just see if I can't. I don't think Mary has joined us online. Um, would I like, would I like, would you like uh, Elise and Kira um, to introduce one of your in-person speakers and I might get on the phone and, and catch up with Mary. So how about we do that? Wonderful, thank you so much, um, Michelle. Um, I'm gonna welcome Robert Peakin from Food Connect um, up to, to uh, speak to us today. Rob's been um, an absolute amazing stalwart for social enterprise and also for the uh, regenerative movement um, more broadly, uh, uh, globally and in um, uh, Australia. So we're very pleased to welcome uh, Rob Peakin from Food Connect here today. Thank you. And just before we do, um, could I invite you? Hi, Rob. Could I invite Kira or Elise to change Hello. the screen? I'm not pinned anymore, but you've still got me um, on your screen. Can you just choose to have yourselves highlighted, not me. Huzzah, or even that, that's great. <laughs> Here we go. Is that better? That's fine. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Michelle, and thanks, Elise, for organising um, this session. Uh, just um, before I... Um, oh, you sort of... Can you yeah, you sure? Um, yeah, I was just going to... Um, it's really great to be on here and, and what an amazing sort of uh, opportunity we have. The, uh, uh, as the recent elections have showed us, we're uh, communities wanting much more than what's been offered. Um, and so whilst uh, I might say behind the scenes that uh, we've got to get to 2032 um, as, a, as a humanity, as a species, um, this does give us an opportunity to set some goals and to really integrate our our thinking and and this is a wonderful opportunity for us to start to uh, revision how society could be. Um, before I get going, I'd like to also just acknowledge uh, the uh, the shoulders we're standing on. Um, you know, before as uh, Michelle and and Elise mentioned, um, you know, in Brisbane, it's 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 a very radical city, Brisbane, um, and I think it, uh, the way we I'd like to see us approach this, even though. Uh, Michelle was talking about you know a nice smooth entry to these workshops. I think I think uh, uh, I think uh, this is an opportunity for us to re-radicalize how we approach um, transition or or um, transformation of society because Brisbane has that in its core. It has that through the recent elections. Um, it has that in the um, the early days when when Mary comes on, she can maybe talk about that where we challenged uh, a lot of countries around the world um, by refocusing, by saying, hang on, Australia, you can't talk about South Africa without looking at how we treat our own indigenous population. Um, we have, uh, you know, Steve's in the room and Sabah's in the room. We have uh, uh, where the social enterprise movement in Brisbane um, said, no, we've got to organise <clears throat> ourselves and not take leadership from the intermediaries um, and other organisations. And so the social so QSEC become a member only organisation that leads a lot of the debate. That's a radical step. And now the rest of Australia is following suit. Um, you know, before transition towns, uh, there was other movements in Brisbane. There's, there was a new mutualists 
Um, and obviously before Cook arrived and we settled in Brisbane, there was the, um, the First Nations people. And, um, you know, talking about culture, there could be no better culture that we could point to in terms of using their terms of reference and their epistemology um, as a starting point for rethinking how do we become radical. Uh, it's it's uh, um, the more you immerse yourself into it, and, and Mary Graham was taught by Lilla Watson, who's one of our mentors um, at the shed, um, and her two nieces, uh, Gala and, and Teela. Teela, you might know her as Ancestress, uh, is a pretty fierce, uh, you know, thirty-something-year-old woman who uh, who slaps me around a little bit in in um, in basically stopping me from gambling and from being. Um, you know, too white about our approach. And uh, to give you a, 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 just a, a snippet of an example of how, how, um, <clears throat> how, tran how transformation happens in, in, a, in a human being with us at the shed, like I'm in food systems. My, my main game is food systems. Um, uh, and food's, food is such a great touch point. It is the largest scalable opportunity we have to, um, you know, on most of our grand challenges, if you look at, or like some people call them wicked problems, we're now reframing them as grand challenges. Um, it's much more approachable talking about something um, as a grand challenge. So you look at biodiversity, climate change, water pollution, uh, plastic use, uh, health in particular, um, looking at the 2032 Olympics, it's going to be all about, you know, healthy people running around tracks and jumping over things and, you know, riding push bikes. And I think probably by that stage, we'll have a new, a few new, um, uh, um, um, games that we don't know what they might be. They might be, you know, goodness knows, you know, what they might be. But uh, it's a real, I, I think um, Australia is at a point where 230 years into its history, it hasn't got a food culture. It, it's got all of these cultures that have come to Australia that have made Australia great and diverse and and uh, despite what the you know what the political regime has said, it's a really interesting um, and diverse space. And then we've got this this um, this amazing indigenous First Nations culture that were growing, uh, that were fun before us. Most of you would have read read Bruce Pascoe's work, um, the Dark Emu. Before that, he wrote an amazing book um, called and now it's gone out of my mind. But Bruce. Uh, um, you know, for us uh, to adopt that as a basis for, from a nutrition point of view, and also from, you know, those grasses, the dancing grasses, uh, the kangaroo grasses, all of those grasses um, uh, are, are going to be so important um, from, a, from the point of view of, of, of a land use uh, perspective. If you look at Southeast Queensland and then look to the Western parts of, of, of Southern Queensland in particular, uh, where it's been taken over by buffalo grass and all these imported grasses, um, the soil is so fragile. And if anything, you know, COVID and the flooding was recently, and now we've got flooding in New South Wales. So the food system is such, it's at such a fragile point. It's a really good intersection for us to uh, start to think about, well, what is Australia's food culture and how can we bring the best of that culture from pre-cooked days into the uh, the cultures that have come to Australia and just, you know, uh, you know, you only have to go to Saba's restaurant or any restaurant in Brisbane and you just go, wow, you know, um, it, it's, <laughs> it's a much tastier and healthier um, uh, product than, you know, the, the, the chips and steaks and the, and the, you know, the three veg that uh, the, the Western diet or that, you know, is being imported to Australia. Um, my main game at the moment, even though, you know, I've, We've got uh, quite a lot happening at Food Connect. My main game, my main passion at the moment is milling flour. Um, it, it's uh, and that's given me another entry point into the the nutrition system of grains, native grains in particular. So dancing grass in particular, you know, is twenty two percent protein. You know, and there's truckloads of it growing growing out there, and we're we're talking to various indigenous organisations and um, there's various institutes that are looking at that and how can we incorporate that into our breads and our um, into our into our into our diet, so um, uh, um, it, it's it's a really fantastic opportunity. And forgive me if I don't take the full fifteen minutes, but I, because I think it's 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 more it's important um, as we go on this conversation that we engage as many people as we can, um, and we have um, deep conversations and give everyone in this community agency 
over how they can participate in something rather rather than sort of you know people have been around for a while and getting a bit crusty and sometimes a bit sort of um, snarky about how the world hasn't shifted as much as we'd like it to change harder you'd you'd be agreeing with me and <laughs> Jeff as well um, but but it, it is it is it's sort of like this point where 2032 does give us this opportunity where um, I work with WWF uh, on their Regenerate uh, program. I'm also on the Sustainable Tables um, Advisory Board, and we're, uh, we had 187 projects come across our table last year to fund in the food system space. So it, it, the change is wanting to happen from outside the space, and we've got to sort of facilitate that change to come in. Um, and importantly, as Indigenous culture teaches us, it has to be uh, connected. You know, everything they do, everyone has their purpose. No one is king. No one is 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 left out in in the conversation and but importantly everyone has an autonomous um everyone has autonomy and, and hopefully mary will cover this this in in uh, much more articulate for the, than i will but in terms of uh when you give someone agency over uh, um becoming fully human and mary mary might touch on the point that she you know that we're as white people we're nowhere near fully human um, and until you embrace the terms of reference that come from not just Australian First Nations, but lots of those First Nations cultures, you really uh, expose yourself to, oh my God, we're a, we're a culture based on fear. We're a culture based on scarcity. And yet when you talk to Mary and, and Lilla, Aunt Lilla and others, they expose you to a whole other paradigm of being in the world of having autonomy, having agency, and unfolding your highest and best use, and falling in your love with love with yourself, because you're using all your fac faculties. You're intellectually stimulated, you're culturally stimulated, um, you're physically stimulated because you're doing stuff on the ground. You're not a consultant who's just up there in fairy floss land, not uh, grounded. Um, so it's really important that we use this opportunity to engage as many people, and that includes the people we don't agree with. You know, um, the Brisbane Committee, for instance, you know, they've got their own track. This is going to be uh, an amazing opportunity for developers, you know. So we need to engage with them and say, well, actually, this, this, there's ways that they could have resilient cities or livable cities incorporating all the things that we bring as the social enterprise sector. Um, so um, uh, with that, I'll say, I'll sit down. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, Elise, um, Mary is here now, so we might um, introduce, um, I'll introduce Mary and um, find her on screen. And if you on your um, end of things could also, I will pin Mary. Mary, are you there, my dear? And would you like to um, turn on your video perhaps? Or not? <laughs> Hello, we can see you now. Okay. Oh, you're on mute, Mary. Um, if you could just unmute now. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Hello, can you good hear me? morning. Yes, <laughs> yeah. we can hear you. Yes. Thank, thanks so much thanks. for joining us, Mary. Yes, how are you? Yeah, Everybody. we're all good. How are you? We've got, we've got some people in the room in the in the room at Brisbane. They're at the Brisbane Business Centre in the Queen Street Mall. Uh, business, we've got right. some people online, so it's the usual fun challenge of a hybrid event. Yes. I apologise, there's a bit of background noise here at my place. Um, but to introduce the wonderful Mary Graham, Mary is an adjunct associate professor at the University of Queensland, and that noise is getting worse, so I'm going to keep it short. We invited Mary to share with us. Um, Mary is a very respected thinker, writer, philosopher, political scientist, governance expert, and more. Um, and Mary, what we're talking about today is what kind of cultures can we harness and develop and love, uh, bringing us all together here in Brisbane and helping to build a regenerative society. So uh, you're, on mute. you're on mute again, Mary. Oh, she's saying, give me a minute. No worries. This is the joys of working from home. I've got noise outside my door and it looks like Mary's got someone chatting to her, so it won't be long. How are you guys going in the room, Kira? You all comfy? Uh, yes, we're all good, thank you. That's good. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine, Mary. Yes. I, I was just saying that um, we'd love you to chat with us for 15 or more minutes, 20. Yes. Um, just about, I know a lot of people look to you um, because you do explain how Indigenous culture and the relationist ethos and the law of obligation and all of these aspects fit together to help inform things that many of us non-Indigenous people are really keen to learn about. So if you would just like to share your insights on what culture is. Yeah. Um, well, what yeah, you thank you. Thank you. Well, um, what, what, what I'd really like to do is to um, share with you what I've learned actually from, from my own family and from relatives and friends, um, Guri friends, Murray friends, the other word <laughs> for Aboriginal people or First Nations that I've met and worked with over the years and met in my travels and so on. And I've tried to... Uh, remember and put it together into some form of um, not easy understanding, but um, uh, some general all purpose kind of way of um, that, that gives an entrance for a whole lot of people, including younger Aboriginal people, uh, but, but all kinds of um, non-Aboriginal uh, cultures, others for, you know, to, um, find out what I've what I've actually learned and what I'm still learning actually. I'm still learning a whole lot of things. Um, and I'd like to say that it's um, it's an amazing um, journey because um, and because of the great age, you know, society, Aboriginal society is of such a great age, you know, um, they took all these thousands of thousands of years, tens of thousands of years to figure things out because everybody has to go through all of these things. Um, every culture that is, every ancient culture and, uh, and a new one too, like um, actually colonial cultures that among them only usually number about three, four, 500 years, maybe, maybe at the most, you know, but there's still a long, long way to go, uh, including getting to know the land that you're in, you know, and that probably that has been invaded by, by different people, different cultures that do that sort of thing or did that sort of thing and still you could argue that still do that sort of thing um so um so some of the things um that i guess aboriginal people and again when i when i'm talking about aboriginal people i'm talking about indigenous people in many cultures many parts of uh continents around the around the world you know and while they're all the same in many, many ways, they all have their own distinct cultures too. They're all different in different ways. And again, according to the land that they live in. So for example, um, Australia started off in a different, first, very, very uh, odd way. It is, first of all, it is a great island continent, a great island continent. It didn't, it wasn't in uh, a particular areas or regions where they were, next where their region was very close up right up against another people's culture in in roughly the same region or a ne next door neighbor you know region um and so on and so on so in other words they weren't um exposed to a whole lot of things that starts a culture off in either of two ways the relationless ethos a relationalist ethos or a survivalist ethos. So in a way, it's, you could say it's fate, <laughs> you know, just straight out fate, F-A-T-E, fatalistic, but without becoming fatalistic actually, by the way. But um, so Aboriginal people didn't have to worry about, say, invasions, either from within or from without until two, 300 years ago, actually, you know. Um, there were other visitors like from different Asian cultures, but they were basically a good positive uh, trade relationships. So in other words, they came to the, this continent and went again. They came back and forward, back and forth. And that went on for two, uh, a thousand and uh, nearly 2000 years, actually. So it was a good positive um, um, trade relationship with, with the occasional fights, apparently. Yeah, and it's all in the stories there. Um, but other other cultures, they were exposed to not just invasions, but natural things like uh, famines, 
uh, or maybe even viruses from way back, you know, uh, not just the Black Death and things like that, uh, but other things. Uh, but occasional, you know, inv invasions, um, all kinds of things they had to put up with. So they learned to have a, um, a, a survivalist mentality. So an Aboriginal people ha um, um, worked on and were had to understand the difference between the two. So Aboriginal people, as they say, they didn't come from anywhere else, like the whole um, human um, migration um, rule of thumb, you know, that thought, that idea, that school of thought, I should say. Um, so while uh, technically, physically, technically, of, to do with ancient human beings and the beginning, you know, the development of hum humanness, um, when Aboriginal people are asked to comment on that, they'll say, you know, no, we didn't come from anywhere else. This country, we were, this country helped us to be human. It grew us up, they'll say. This, this is the land that grew us up, you know. In other words, they really, really mean that. So the humanness uh, was ref came, came into being through this reflective idea. Of, of what makes people, humans, different from other forms of life. Um, plus other forms of life were seen as ha uh, having the, you know, the fortune of being uh, first in line. <laughs> they're our, they become our ancestors too. So our ancestors are not just human, they're, they're non-human also. And then we come along um, and then they teach us what it means to be human. We learn, and there are wonderful, wonderful dreaming stories about this. And one of them is, um, um, and this is a public story. Um, so, you know, have uh, permission to, to tell this, this public one, even though it's, you know, it's a public one, um, the dreaming story. Um, so the world, the earth is like a flat plane, a flat featureless plane. Underneath, though, um, there are uh, there is life dormant, dormant life. At some point or other, it's disturbed, and they awake, and the the, the life forms make their way to the top. Um, and there's nothing on top; it's just all completely flat. No trees, no mountains, no you know um, uh, anything at all. And when they arrive there, when they emerge above the surface of this uh, land, feature this lunar scape. Um, they're huge, huge. So um, everything is uh, outsize. So a kangaroo is uh, big as a two-story building. A snake is as big as a train. And as they move about and engage with one another in, in quite um, conflictive ways, they fight and argue in the story. They fight and they argue, run about, chase one another, um, kill one another, make love all very human-like activity. <laughs> um, and in their movements, in their drama, they actually create the, the land itself. They actually create the landscape, actually. So, and as they're creating the landscape, um, there's still some other life forms there, one left remaining. And in the story, as the story goes, it, it crawls to the surface, it makes its way. And what it is, is um, they're proto-humans. They're proto-humans, so in other words, they're still in a fetal stage. The um, the by now the ancestors, the life forms that have gone before, um, actually help them to become not just proto-humans but full fully formed human beings. And there's a wonderful description of this. So these other uh, ancestral beings by now, you know, uh, all flora, fauna, insects, everything you can think of that exists now. Um, help them to stand up straight, straighten out their back, clear their nose and mouth and slap them on the back to help them breathe. Um, um, work on their limbs, their legs and their arms, uh, clear their fingers, you know, and exercise, basically exercise them. So they help them to become, finish the, finish the job of becoming fully bound human beings, march them up and down, walk around to exercise and so on and so on. And then they pass on what, uh, what is called the law, L-A-W-L-O-R-E. They pass it on to these brand new human beings and they tell them everything what, what, uh, what the whole of life means, basically. So it's law too. It's what, what is happening to you, what it all means. And this is, 
this is what you have to do, basically. So the law of how to how to be in this country. Um, and then they, those ancestral beings, the large beings, go back to sleep. They're still there asleep, back to dormant life. And they're still there alive today, you know. And now they're the normal size, just normal size, filling out the landscape, trees, rivers, everything, you know, normal size, kangaroos, snakes, whatever. And um, by then, the normal size humans, they have the uh, basically the rule book or the guide, <laughs> the stories that are, that is of how to look after the land. So that, in other words, they have a relationalist ethos. They have a relationalist ethos. So it's like this: that all human beings have are relationalists and survivalists. Um, but a relationalist ethos means that you have something more important than yourself outside the self, the human self, and that is land itself. So land has created us. Um, it looks after us. It continue. It looked after us in the beginning. Made us what we are. Uh, looked after us as far as resources and things like that go. They continue to do that over the long periods of time. And finally, in the final um, um, understanding, they give us meaning. Land gives us meaning in life. That's the greatest gift and you know, what it's all about, basically. And the gift is, of course, is reciprocity. Uh, so it looks uh, it goes like this. It looks after us. We get the idea <laughs> after a long time uh, that we are supposed to look after it. So this recip recip reciprocal um, meaning in life happens. So two relationships, the relationship between land and humans, and then the relationship between humans. And the relationship between humans, that is the political social ordering uh, system, is always contingent on the relationship between humans and land. So you have to keep in the in your mind in this relationalist ethos or philosophy, if you like, um, meaning of life, um, Weltanschauung, you know the German word for a worldview. Uh, you have to keep in mind that we always have to have this law of obligation that comes first. Look, look as a, as a old Aboriginal people have always said, look after land, um, care for country, care for kin. Look after the land and look after kin. And in other words, your mob. Look after humans. In other words, the survivalist ethos, though, uh, is we're all survivalists too. You've got to watch yourself when you go out and cross the road. You don't get hit by a bus. <laughs> uh, where you where you've lived, where you live, uh, wherever you are, uh, be sure to eat the right thing. You don't get poisoned. You know whether it's ten thousand years ago or whether it's. Uh, next week, you go to the, uh, a good restaurant, not a bad restaurant. Of course, you might get poisoned there too. Um, so it's small scale stuff, large scale stuff, uh, survivalism. We're all survivalists, everybody uh, from the beginning. Um, but a survivalist ethos says that if the, the things that you've been through, the crises, various crises, have um, altered your way of thinking to such an extent that you think, you imagine, or you really do believe you've been through such a hard time, you or your people been through such a hard time that the whole of life is a struggle. The whole of existence is one of a hostile existence. You can't trust the natural, the natural world. Too, too many bad things are happening. You know, you're on the run. You're, you can't trust the uh, human world or society or the political life. You know, you're on the run. People want to kill you, basically, or take you prisoner, uh, and so on. Or you're poverty stricken, and so on. So you start to think in this survivalist ethos way that that hostility. You are facing hostility, and you pass that on to other people. Your your descendants, they grow up to think that yes, the world is a is like a war. And there's all these sayings, hey, as we know, do, uh, the world is a dog eat dog place. You know, every man for himself. You look after yourself first and don't worry about other people, you know. And that's an old sense of being, sense of um, living. And it's lasted to this day. In fact, it's gotten worse to this day. So people have to arm themselves, if not uh, purely psychologically, um, politically, socially, definitely militarily, you know. That, that is a survivalist society that thinks in that way. And not, but the wonderful thing is that not everybody thinks in that way. 
it, 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 it wouldn't have, human life wouldn't have lasted very well if it was just all completely kill or be killed, you know, wouldn't have lasted. You have to have this other relationless thing. So land is important. It helps to have a good logic though too. Um, uh, now, all logics are the same in, um, um, that is they're not the same uh, in worth, I suppose, you know, um, in a way. Um, so we don't have a um, Aristotelian logic, a logic there's three rules, either or, um, any, any sentence that begins with either or, either you're a friend of the Americans or you're an enemy. That's the current logic that rules the globe at the moment. It really is a logic, excluded middle, it's called, excluded middle. That you, ha you can't even sit on the fence anymore. You have to choose one side or another. And woe be tied if you don't pick the right one, you know. So that's why the world is slowly turning into either or, actually, at the moment. The other one is any sentence that begins with um, um, something like um, all, you make a you make a, a brash statement like all redhead people are mad. I know Miss Jones, she's got red hair. She, Miss Jones must be mad, you know. So first premise is all something are or somebody is, you know. Uh, you could use anything, you know, any any argument. The second premise upholds that first premise. Then the then the uh, conclusion confirms those first two premises. So any sentence that begins like that. Um, the, the, that's, uh, the other one, the first one was uh, excluded middle. This one and the next one are the uh, law of um, identity and the law of uh, contradiction or non-contradiction. You know? um, so the third one is any sentence that begins with if something or other, something or other, then or therefore something or other, something or other, something like that. So those, those Aristotelian logics everybody knows that there's more to logic than that there's lots and lots of gray bits but that particular logic um, is still in place in western law that's why they tell you you know answer this question yes or no you know you are ordered to answer yes or no you know um, and of course it's in science it's in science and research you know you've got a proposal research proposal you've got to prove you've got to prove that it's valid you know it's either that or not you know, um, Aboriginal logic is more to do with the land. You look at that map, Aboriginal language map, it goes something like multiple, multiple places. Uh, a place is, um, a dream, every place has a dreaming story. Um, you, you can say, um, uh, what do you call it? A genesis. Just imagine a great big island continent that's, that can um, fit in the whole of Europe. The whole of Europe can fit into this country. And every part though, every area or region has its own um, ge genesis. Not one genesis for the whole country, just hundreds of genesis. So multiple genesis or dreaming stories. Dreaming story is the law, L-A-W-L-O-R-E, for that region. Uh, multiple ones of that. Uh, and sometimes overlapping, but, um, and then the multiple, um, uh, that leads on to multiple um, conscious, conscience. Um, consciousness, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, sorry, um, truth, I'm sorry, I'm getting some things mixed up, uh, truth, so uh, every region has its own truth, that is the truth about all kinds of things in life, so uh, no, no notion of an absolute truth, this is multiple truths across the country, from every region, you see, uh, and a truth for a place, um, so no absolutism in thinking, that's what it means. So um, the absolute, uh, absolutism uh, is really just, uh, sorry, um, the truth is just really the perspective of the whole of life from that region. So it, the equation works out to be all perspectives are valid and reasonable. Now that, that logic has to go with, and it does, fits in perfectly <laughs> with the law of obligation. So every different region the people look after their region. You're obliged to, which is an obligation that never ends. And that logic helps that, you know? So every person, every people, all, all the different clan groups, including every individual, they're all autonomous beings, everybody. But out there, uh, you know, nature itself is autonomous too. It owns itself, 
and humans sooner or later have to realize that <laughs> uh, because you're just you're just realizing it now eh? you know with these terrible you know fires and floods it definitely it is its own boss you know whether whether or not it was man-made you know the climate change thing because as we know those things have happened naturally before you know so um more more um obligation to look after land uh more awareness that uh, it has to be looked after first you know and to care for uh, and so on and so on um so um I don't know if we're running out of time. No, I think that's that's an absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And I know it's a very short amount of time, Mary, but thank yeah. you. Um, yeah. If people what, want to ask questions or I don't yeah, know, because it is huge. It's a huge thing, you know, and they have, you know, they, they, they and I always come back to that thing of being a, an island continent. See, we had time to work, work all this out, whereas a whole lot of other places, not to make excuses for uh, imperialism and colonialism. I'm not saying that, but it's sort of like when you look at it in a huge picture like that, you know, it's no wonder people end up with a, a logic that, you know, you know, attack them before they attack you. Yeah. You know what I mean? All that. And Mary, when you and I have mm. spoken, we've often said that if you put it in modern terms, um, Indigenous mm. cultures on this continent were the earliest examples of steady state bioregional earth-centred right. governance exactly um, yeah, exactly justice yeah yes yes we um there was an idea about a steady state economy eh? and the first thing i thought of was well how do you get a steady state economy without a, a steady state culture you know? mm. you've got to have that first and then people will understand that you've got to look after people you it should be against the law to have say homeless people you know people living on the street in yeah. the most awful poverty you know, while someone else lives in a palace, you know, and you might say that <laughs> sounds like spiritual uh, socialism or something. <laughs> uh, but um, but no, that's that's that is exactly what it should be about, you know. Um, and it because, is about that in many yeah. cultures, you know. Oh, and it is, yeah, many Rob, cultures. Rob yeah. sort of mentioned, you know, mm. some of the some of the, and we don't want to offend ourselves as non-indigenous mm. people, thinking no. we're mean and nasty, but as no. an institutionalized culture. Yes. It's yes. very competitive, very hierarchical. Yeah. And as and you see, say, we have homelessness, we have um, people terrible. without, we have more, some people and, with and this and Completely with absent uh, health, goods health system. And I often refer back to, it's not as if um, the West doesn't know these things, um, because that invention of, uh, I think it was a Welsh, um, Welsh um, prime minister uh, in the 50s or after the Second World War, the National Health Service. See that, that is, from our point of view, that would be like, you've just um, uh, invented uh, the a part of the law of obligation. Mm -hmm. That comes under this heading of the law of obligation. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, as we speak, there are um, um, vested interests over there who want to turn that, get rid of that and turn mm -hmm. it into an American style health system, which means making money basically, mm -hmm. and don't look after the poor, you know? Uh, and that's terrible. That's absolutely a terrible idea. So, Mary, um, because you're online, what we might do with, with permission from our remaining two speakers, we might just take a couple mm. of quick questions mm. for you, Mary, and then you're very welcome to stay online and listen yes. in. Okay. Um, but it does also get you off the hook if you've got to go to another meeting. Yeah, I, I do. Um, Elise, I can see you there. Did you have a question? Yeah, we've Mary? got a question from Rob. Hey, yep. hey Mary. Um, oh. Robert Peacock. Yes, yes how, how are you? you? Yes, good, thanks. Could, could you touch on... Um, Two of the other terms of reference you, you speak about, um, power and balance. Oh, and yes, how, yeah. Yeah, um, just to, yeah yes. because as we've seen in the recent election, you know, that's been mm. challenged and this yes. is all about, this is all about the sessions, all about starting mm. a conversation of the culture that yes. leads to the 2032 Olympics. And obviously there's a lot of power. Invested. Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, well, I think all old cultures, ancient ones, they all had to work out something really important and, and which again, Aboriginal people had to work out too. The two big things about uh, having a, a, a secure society where um, security, stability is really, really important um, is to work out the, what I call problematics of power and authority power and authority. Most ancient cultures, most the beginning of states 
I'm not talking about the nation state, I'm talking about ancient states like, you know, the um, Egyptian Empire and the Persian Empire and so on, so on and Chinese empires and so on. Um, they all, um, what they did was conflate, conflate, join together, force together power and authority. And so if you have power, that if you have power, that gives you the authority to have the kind of society that you, as uh, the ruling group um, on the top of the hierarchy, and it's always a hierarchy, that ruling group with its um, own um, army and guards and, you know, so on and so on, they can force the rest of the society to do what they want. Otherwise, they'll be punished severely, you know. Um, what Aboriginal people did, they did something quite unique, um, and I don't know if many others did this, but I, I've, I've heard of uh, similar things in that with um, Native American people, um, uh, groups. Um, they separated power and authority. So authority consists of not what I call knowledgeable people. They're knowledgeable people. And knowledgeable people, um, mainly older people, but not always older people. They understood very well the common sense thing of, no, you know, not everybody grows wise with age, <laughs> you know, that understanding, and that's quite true. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of older people, but also younger people who are very, very smart, very smart. And the most important key thing, skill, skill that younger people have to have is to be good self-managers, not to be egotistical because egoism is 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 glued on in the younger you are and and gradually as you get older you learn you're supposed to learn how not to be so egotistical um so the authority people what i call um you know the uh, and they're a group they're not one person it's usually a group and it's women it's a, so it's a governance a gendered governance gendered um it's got to be because uh there are two different aspects of human life you know of life itself um between men and women. So you've got to have both running society and rock quite, running it quite in a balanced way. Exactly. You know, not many men. Um, so authority is there. Um, and authority is separated from power. Power um, is diffused throughout all the rest of the society. So power, you know, the old um, protest uh, slogans about power to the people or power for the people and so on and so on with the raised fist, you know. Uh, well, just imagine this old ancient system, they put that into their actual, put that uh, that notion into their actual um, uh, political and social sis ordering system. Uh, a friend of mine has often said uh, about it being a Aboriginal society is a, a long-term experiment in human order making a long-term experiment in human order making. And that's what they found. It's a better idea to separate power and authority. They're on the same level, but the authority people, knowledgeable people don't boss around or act like um, it's not a hierarchy. It's a flat system, basically flat. So what it really means too is, um, is that while it's easier, easier and more to the point, uh, um, to have hierarchy, um, there's too many accidents with it. <laughs> and, and not only that, if people, the cruelty of a hierarchical system, generally, sooner or later, people get sick and tired of it, that gets overturned. But what happens is another hierarchy comes into being. And no, no, we'll do the right thing. We won't uh, hurt people or we won't do damaging things or anything. And of course, they end, always end up doing that. So the Aboriginal system is a flat system where you are obliged or almost forced, but not by by older people, but you you are you have to put a huge amount of effort into working together and you have to put things in their right order, the right order that land comes first. Once you know how to look after land, then that's the great blueprint or tem template for having the right kind of human ordering system, political and social ordering system. But also, it, it, you, you must take time to get on with each other. You have to have a really smart way, a system of managing conflict. And that you work on that really hard. You don't enforce, you know, don't have cruel, coercive enforcement of, of uh, a system which punishes, looks to punish people and coercive. And always, always with that um, gender balance. So 
power and authority but also the it's a the matching thing of that on the other side if you like is the same with stability and security people often mistake that you stability goes with security and it doesn't again aboriginal people separated those two things too you'll only get security if you if you go about stability you know the the fit, so system of stability in the right way and again stability is looking after the people see looking after land so that's why aboriginal people never had this um um concept it's not even in language concept of invasion because you're well on the way to instability or instability i should say <laughs> an unstable system if you go around invading other people's country you can have conflict you can have conflict as long as the good ways are working it out and so on but you can't go around invading other people's countries you know just imagine what the world would have been like if they'd have just didn't didn't go out in sailing boats sailing ships around the other side of the world invading other people's countries you know mm. Thanks, Mary. Hey, um, we've got one question which is really pertinent from Supriya. Um, she's asking what your vision is or what you think we should do um, about the 2032 Olympics in Brisbane. And in particular, I would m maybe invite you, Mary, to talk quickly about what you guys did for the Commonwealth Games. I know mm. that you developed protocols, um, but mm. with the Brisbane Olympics, obviously many people are concerned um, about the yes. in social mm. justice and land. What are yes. your thoughts, Mary? Well, really, quickly because I can't really say um, because there are two different groups you see on north and south side uh, I would say first of all first of all try and work out something they have to work out something in a way between each other themselves you know um, how to how to handle this um, and it's best if, if if they were contacted first of all and when I say first of all I don't mean the last minute like it's two years to go to the Commonwealth Games, I would start talking with them now, you know, and I know that the Commonwealth Games, uh, sorry, Olympic Games people are actually starting, you know, there's already a committee, I think, if I'm not mistaken, a, um, Games Committee. Oh, yeah. uh, and I, I think they've got, at this stage, only one, I think, Aboriginal person on it. Uh, I, I am hoping that they have both, uh, at least a man and a woman, you know, male and female, uh, but also both groups on that on that committee and it it's a big global committee you know it, it's, it represents global interests different countries and so on and so on i would hope that they have both that is male female and the place place people north and south mobs <laughs> that's that's all i could say that's the only other thing to say you know because uh that, a beginning like that you have to take into account that there possibly will be, um, you know, riots, uh, not riots, um, protests at least, but that's how we did it. We, uh, down here, because it is in, the, it was in the Yugumbe language uh, people uh, region, you see this region. So we all got together, a lot of elders again, and worked out how we wanted to run things, how we wanted to see this event run. First of all, we sorted out, uh, yes, basically after some toing and froing, we basically said, well, look, there's a lot of Aboriginal people who do want this to go on. Some Aboriginal people don't. So we'll go at this point, we'll go with that they do want to have it. And so we don't have any, um, you know, um, it's right or wrong. We'll accept a compromise. We'll go with it as long as it's run very well by everybody involved. And that means the Blackfellas. Uh, the visiting blackfellas to the place, um, the visiting whitefellas to the place, the com uh, the com games people themselves, the lo local government, the Gold Coast City Council, every other uh, body that's involved. So we wrote out our own rules and presented it to them, including the police. We said we want you to behave in a good way. That's it. These are the things that you mustn't do. Don't damage any part of the country, of the land. Um, be polite you know, to everybody. Uh, and if you have to, the protest mob, if they have to have protests, well, make sure it's not too, you know, it's not violent. It's probably going to be loud. It's going to interrupt people. It's going to stop the traffic. <laughs> and all that's okay, but don't don't go overboard with it, you know. And, and of course, we said that to the police to be polite to people. You'll be amazed, amazed at what happens when you treat people with politeness and good manners, you know. <laughs> so we said that to more or less everybody, you know.
but we did lay out the rules and i would love to see the uh, brisbane mob brisbane mobs talk like that too you know or say something similar yeah. you know we have a set of rules we want these to be you know say it to those global mobs thank you mary um, look, I'm just aware of time. Um, sorry. What I no, don't be sorry. We, as you know, we could all listen to you for days on end. What I wanted to say is, um, we might move to our next two speakers. But for those folks who would like to hear more from Mary, do remember that she's got a lot of recordings available online on the website. And only a few weeks ago, we were so lucky because Mary gave us a one-hour talk, um, like a public lecture, as part of the Green Prince exchange process so what we're doing with green prince exchange is inviting wonderful humans like mary graham will stefan many other people to talk about um, their area of interests and work in such a way that people can really start to dig a little deeper into their thinking so mm -hmm. um we will put a link in the chat to the green prince website where you can see um and access mary's amazing talk and mary we will hopefully be drawing you in to the region brisbane discussions as an expert thinker, um, I know it's not your traditional country um, and we really respect that you're able to speak with us about the bigger picture about Indigenous culture and other issues. So right, okay. Thanks. So to say thank you heaps. Um, thank you. Thank and you. if, if you can you. stay on a little bit longer to listen yes. to the next oh, you're very welcome yeah. to, but we understand that you're very, very busy. So yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, now I might hand over to the lovely ladies back in the room. Um, Thanks, Michelle, and thank you so much, um, uh, Mary. That was really enlightening and, um, you know, amazing takeaways there for how we could actually work together and work collaboratively. Really fantastic. I'd like to invite um, Richard and Michael to the to the podium. Um, it is a little bit awkward, guys. You might need to stoop down a little bit, but um, uh, if you guys could um, centre yourselves around here. The, um, uh, Richard's from the Nanda Co-op. And Michael Chu, founding members of Social Enterprise. Well, Sorry, Elise, just so you know, when you step to that side, we can't hear you. It's okay. muffled. So you guys need to stick in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear yep. me now? Yep. Yep. Well, we might we might welcome oh sorry. Well, thank you, Elise. And um thank you, thank you, uh, uh Dr. Mary Graham. Um and I, I could have just I could just sit and listen to you speak for another another few hours. Um, I've only ever had the pleasure of um, hearing. I, I studied at UQ with um, Anthony Kelly, and um, uh, our our co-op model is is based on that sort of community development approach that we learnt um, was taught back then at UQ, and had the privilege of um, uh, Tony would would often share with us. Um, writings or teachings from uh, from Mary so sort of had had that second hand but it's, it was it was great it was wonderful listening to you um and I'll, I'll just start a bit and then Michael I'll pass over to you as a member of the co-op um is it yeah yeah just a quick reminder Kira Mary Graham is still up on your screen but she's not spotlighted anymore so oh there we go okay Thank yeah you. and actually I just wanted to um before actually a couple of weeks ago I was reading the paper and um I was reading an article by a Klondamuka artist Megan Cope and she actually mentioned she referenced Mary and it really struck me as something that goes very deep um very deep and I think the quote was something around, and I could be misquoting it, Mary, so I'm very sorry um, if I if I am. But she was sort of talking about how, um, uh, um, you know, we often, or Western society, we're often sort of located here. I, I think, therefore I am. So I'm this sort of individual being. But, you know, there's a very different perspective, which Mary was just speaking to, is that I'm located on, and I'm co-located. So I'm not just this here I'm this I'm this I'm you know that and that that goes really really deep and it it, it cracks you open and it opens you up um and I think that and it's really powerful and so that really it really struck me in that that media article um that was it's it's yeah it's really powerful so anyway um that's that, so I'll just tell you a little bit about who we are, because we, we come out of a cooperative tradition, 
and a community development tradition. Um, and culture is really important in that, how, uh, how you show up and, and what, what, your, what your values are and, and, and why you're there and who you're there with and that relational ethos that um, Mary was, was speaking about before. Um, so we started um, in, in Nanda, so we're based in Nanda, and there were a group of people with intellectual disabilities and mental health um, diagnoses who were long-term unemployed. So they'd been going through um, to job agencies um, multiple times, 20, 30 times, not getting a job. Um, so using community development principles, we said, why don't we bring people together and see what they want to do about it? And so people came together. And initially they were blaming themselves. It's my fault I haven't got a job. I'm a bad person. Um, I'm no good. Um, I just don't fit in. Uh, to when they came together, they realized, hey, other people have got the same sort of challenge as me. Maybe it's not my fault. Um, and maybe there's something we can do about it together. Um, so, so people came together and what they decided to do was set up their own businesses. And this is a group of eight people, very disadvantaged societally. Um, but they started um, with some volunteers, some support of some community workers, their own energies, um, and started making little cut sandwiches and veggie boxes from the fruit markets and um, mowing people's backyards with um, uh, someone's borrowed lawnmower. Um, I won't go into the long story because I'd like to pass over to Michael because he's one of the members, but basically that little co-op um, now employs 35 people with uh, disabilities, also people from refugee and migrant backgrounds who've been um, unemployed, um, has mows like 50 parks in Brisbane, has a cafe under City Hall, a cafe in Nanda, um, and it's very much member-based. We put a lot of energy into, so we run a business which has to be profitable, um, but it's about creating employment for people and um, very flattened sort of hierarchy. Um, and it's very much about member engagement, member control, member ownership. Everyone's responsible and has a part to play. Um, uh, so, um, and from, Humble beginnings, you know, it's it's not a huge organisation, but it's about one and a half million dollars in turnover, owned by the the, the members um, uh, and and local community, and loved by the local community. Um, uh, and there's an ecological ethos as well, which which sits under what we do. Um, so that's that's our little story. And I'll pass over to Michael, who's one of the founding members, and he's also on the board of directors. So I'll pass over to you, Michael, to talk. Hi, my name's Michael Cherry. I work at the Nunda Car. And basically, I had challenges at the beginning looking for work and basically wondering what, what, what can I do to find work? And the jobs were just really hard back then. And since I started working for the car, my mental health has improved. I've enjoyed working there. Um, there have been challenges in my life with work and everything else but at the moment everything's going well and I enjoy what I'm doing. I believe the challenges with people with a disability too that that they're trying to find work as well and it's hard for people with a disability to find work when there's bosses out there that just don't care about the people with a disability. They think they don't have the job, the company to do the job, which I think is wrong. We people with a disability have are just as good as anybody else out there who can't find a job, who work. I'm one of the people who've lived, been working for 22 years, 23 years. And I can tell you in experience that working at a job like this can be challenging, but can be good as, as well. Getting, you really get to do different things like work in the kitchen, mowing parks, jobs like plants and you learn different things in the job that really gives you their experience that not many jobs will give you that chance. This job has for me and it has for a very long time. 
And I just wish there was more people out there that they could find a job and and realize that bosses out there, that people like us who, who are capable of doing the job and giving us a giving us a go would is always a good thing. It's giving people a go is actually a positive thing because there's people out there who have mental problems, um, disabilities, and they do are capable of doing a lot more than what people think they do. And I'm just one of those people that prove that I've proved people that I am capable of working hard and it's proved my mental health. It's my mental being. I've got good friends. I've made good friends out of this job. I've basically met my supervisors who are helpful and kind. And just recently I saw a young youth cop and how they ran and it was, it was all positive from the way I saw it. Seeing young people come into the into the community with work, and, and the young, young, the younger people are coming in, finding work, and working hard. That's it's always a positive thing for a lot of people. So thank you. Um, thanks so much, Michael and, and Richard um, from the Nundercop. And the cooperative movement is all about actually um, uh, exactly what Mary was um, telling us all about, really working from the heart, um, connecting with others, including voices from other, from other people, really trying to lean into that space and work together. Um, our last speaker here is Saba Abraham, who, um, as I said at the beginning, is the Australian of the Year local hero for Queensland and also one of the founders of QSEC and uh, works very uh, hard in the cold communities um, and has got some wonderful things to share with us about how to include voices from uh, different cultures and different abilities. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for a wonderful... Speak up, <laughs> That's my challenge. Uh, thank you, Lisa uh, and Kiza for this opportunity. Um, and also thank you for the previous uh, speakers. Uh, we are for all we have a common. Uh, that's why we are here. Uh, our commonality is our great power to connect and to make change. Um, As I am for non-for-profit, uh, ah, okay, all right, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I would like to read a word say prayer. Uh, I am the founder of, founder and director of Morris Erickson Recent and Catering, which is a social enterprise non-for-profit which provides on-the-job training for disadvantaged refugee, asylum seeker, and immigrant women who have language and cultural barriers in accessing employment in Brisbane. Today, um, I would like to touch base about the culturally and lingu ling linguistically diverse CAD community and the way value cross-cultural through community development. The term CAD community describes communities with diverse language, ethnic background, nationality, traditions, societal structures, and religious. Religions. This community faces diverse issues that cause barriers to community development, such as language, uh, language stereotypes, and pre prejudices, sign and symbols, behaviors, and beliefs and the ethnocentrism, a us value, uh, 
versus them mentality. So those culture, uh, cultural issues or barriers led to community issues around settlement and immigration, pre-immigration history of torture and trauma, lack of family and community support, fear of authorities, and a lack of understanding of systems and laws that can provide support uh, and protection to them. This is why community development is essential for card communities. When completed genuinely and effectively, community development has the potential to empower community members and create stronger and more connected communities. Though values and beliefs differ across cultures, effective cross-cultural communication can assist in background in breaking down some of those barriers and increasing access and safety for card communities member, card community members. Respect for an individual's culture, individual's culture including acknowledgement of values and belief systems while recognizing the strengthen peoples from code community uh, backgrounds have is essential. The key to successful de uh, developing culturally and linguistically diverse communities in Australia for any individual or organization should include the following strategies. Genuine, genuinely and transparently engage and understand core local communities values and norms and build positive relationships and trust. Understand the social complexity of the card communities in terms of culture, cultural, religious, ethnic, and structure, structural layers from the top to the bottom. For without a strong relationship and trust, none of them would openly engage in a meaningful way. Empower grassroots groups, social inter sorry. Empower grassroots uh, groups, social enterprises, individuals, and businesses by equipping them with knowledge, skill, and resources so they can so they independently and collaboratively find localized solution to their challenges in a way that suits their functioning as a community. Include them in decision-making processes and program development through professional employment opportunities, especially in leadership roles like on the board, executive, policy and management in general uh, across private community and public sectors. Encourage many stream sports, sporting clubs to participate in community organized sporting events, as well as to support communities to run their own community-based sports uh, events through coordination, funding, and transportation. So they can identify the talented young people from card, card background whose majority never obtain exposure to the public in terms of their ex, uh, exceptional sporting skill that could benefit Australia as a whole. In doing so, 
we create genuine inclusion for card communities, which provides empowerment and support that leads to belonging and connection, but also understanding that bridges the gap between card and non-card communities. In the latter, this develops a more culturally acceptive and sensitive Australia, whereby we work to, towards building people up and assisting in empowering their growth, their, their growth rather than ignore the need for community changes and development. So, um, it's, a, it's just a debate, of course, even though most of you know me, uh, the social enterprise I run, uh, similar to um, the Nanda COP. Uh, Coming as a refugee, of course, it's not a choice. You're forced to leave your country. But it's not only forced to leave your country. In fact, you've been through very tortures and traumatic experiments. Uh, coming from the emerging refugee background, um, people face, if not triple, double disadvantage. Of course, we appreciate the support we get. One, we granted the safe haven in here in Australia. Uh, second, at least you have the right of everybody's hearts, that kind of um, uh, uh, opportunity. But, as it was mentioned the, by the different um, speakers, opportunity is relative. If you don't, you don't able to understand the, the opportunity provide for you, it means nothing to you. If you don't have connection, of course, it's harder to move forward. So, um, the only way you can support uh, those people is help them to create a safe place to connect with the land, to connect with the people. That is, you have to find out what is their issue and then how you can connect the, them without fear. What is good on them, they can work on it. They can feel they are a productive member of this community. Always, if you are recipient, you never feel connected. You never feel valid. So the best way to help them is really creating something or help them to create, or to say, I have this, if I've been given this opportunity or help, I can do this. That's exactly what's happened with the Irish woman, uh, a bit of uh, Ethiopia. They are refugee women, they are illiterate, majority of them, or little education. They are single mothers with a lot of kids. They've been going to the school Training, I mean, their language skill, but they never feel they learn because they are illustrated in their language. And then that torture and trauma, disconnected with, from your family, your community, your land, everything is really not easy. So they said, we are questioning the country. They, people worry as well. They've been all the time depend on the government's money or other support. It's a torture emotionally, if you see it. Uh, so they said, if we work, get work 
For us, it's easy to learn the language. To learn the environment, to learn the system, and to be connected to people and the land. So Mu'uz start. Then we said, let us discuss what we can do. And then through that discussion, we managed to say, yeah, what is on us, we feel we're good to do something and help us to achieve our goal. And then that was cook, because in our culture, women, the main work for women is get married, have your children, and carry your kids, which is a big part of it is food. So we tried that, and it did work. Since the start, more than 400 women, not only from the Irishman women, even when we achieve, we feel we have to open for other uh, refugee women similar to uh, our issue. And this woman, average morals is create 11 women a year, meaningfully full-time, even a lot of them, two jobs uh, in many three. So, um, Despite we don't feel we get much support by the government. Uh, Moros had to support not only providing a job training for those women while they're getting paid, but also we do provide a lot of emotional and sentiment support. Uh, so the government and people she support for uh, a community base, a supporting social enterprise for economical purpose uh, and other. Uh, if this country will able to um, narrow the gap, the gap is creating. Uh, uh, so I would really love to see uh, the a community, each community being supported by providing at least coordinators, funded coordinators, those young people from their early age to do sporting activity and then positively connected to the country and empowered them uh, through that. And at the same time, to encourage the social, social enterprising by providing meaningful and um, support friendly financially and, and expertise as well. So uh, I'll finish in that. So I would like, like to have this question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Michelle, we might turn back to you now. Um, we're going to pose some questions before we break for lunch, I believe. Well, yeah, we've probably only got a little bit of time for questions, um, but very welcome, of course. And um, because we had allowed a good hour and a half for discussions, we can, depending on your catering, we at home can break whenever. So if you want to even just give it five or eight minutes for a few questions, and then yep. if we break at 10 to 12, we can then resume um, at 20 past 12. So that's still fine. Fantastic. Um, so are there any questions from the room here that we want to try and um, uh, contemplate before we, maybe are there any questions in the in the chat room there? No, there's no there's none online yet, but people often think and see how they go. Um, so some really important things that I've kind of picked up in this last um, uh, couple of speakers is, uh, you know, how do we build inclusive conversations? If people are not included in the conversation to begin with early, as as Mary said, it's very hard to, to capture um, some good thoughtful processes that can be added in. So this is why this conversation is, is kickstarting 10 years. I mean, 10 years seems like a long way away, but unless we start having conversations now and start including uh, um, voices from different sectors, we're gonna miss the opportunity. So that was one of the big takeaways for me. And also um, uh, Mary's words around um, you know, really looking at place and looking at 
um, the inclusion of conflict voices, conflicting voices, um, being able to really support everybody's perspectives and gather around all of the different perspectives in the conversation. Um, were there any questions from here, from, from anyone thinking through or maybe statements that they wanted to add in? Silence from the room. I think it yeah. must be time for coffee then. Ah, an observation from anyone? Can you just come up this way? We've got, um, sorry, what's your Aurora. name? Aurora. Yeah. Aurora's from the room here and she's going to just sum up something. Hi, yeah. I just feel really appreciative of like being able to come together in this room and hear different voices. I feel like there's such a, a rich, you know, diversity here in Brisbane. I'm from Melbourne, actually. I've just moved here and I've been to a few of AILA events and listened to Mary Graham before. And I do regenerative um, culture work myself. So I'm really, yeah, excited to continue these kind of conversations and yeah, just like, yeah, listen to the way, you know, like, with the regenerative culture work I do, I kind of, we talk about like listening to the way the ecosystem patterns move and also the the human patterns, you know, and all really like bringing, it's it's kind of like deep listening, right? It's bringing it all together at a deeper level. So I really appreciate you all like bringing your stories along today as a small part of the, in the stepping stone of deeper listening to each other. So thank you. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. So Elise, look, I, I think people will have their time to share um, their further thoughts and discussion um, after the break anyway. So I'm not um, perturbed by the absence of questions. I'm looking forward to the discussions afterwards. Um, perhaps uh, my sort of thinking about uh, wrapping up of this panel discussion is a huge thank you to our speakers and wonderful diversity um, with Rob, with Mary, with folks from Espresso Train, really appreciate that and with Sabah. Um, certainly the things that I'm thinking about as we try to build healthier cultures amongst the way we work together and our future in Brisbane, I hear what Mary and other Indigenous and Earth-centred people say all the time, which is the land is the template for how we live and work together, that relationship with country, with land, with the plants and the animals. I mean, and for us inside the Australian Earth Laws Alliance with the Green Prince approach, one of the reasons we're so keen to support the regenerative movement is to build on all the other awesome movements, but to really try to make sure that the voices of the plants and the animals are really held in deep respect. Often they get lost uh, amongst the, the noise of humans talking to each other, but deep listening and really thinking about where Brisbane is located, what the traditional owners have done in this place over time and what we can learn from that and really how to change the way we interact with the living world into the future. That's certainly, I think, an important part of the cultural transition that non-Indigenous people need to do is to really take the time to listen and care for country. Um, so that's just my little wrap up in terms of things to think about when we come back together in half an hour. And I really wanna thank you all. Um, Michelle, should we um, uh, go through the key questions that we want people to start to mull over over the break? Yes, um, so I'll, I think, I'll bring them up again on screen. You keep talking yeah. and I will bring them up while you chat. So the, mm -hmm. the topic today is what might a vision for a diverse and inclusive culture look like? And then we have three key questions that you might like to consider individually or you might like to consider as a whole or you might like to consider from your own perspective and all voices, as um, Mary um, highlighted to us, are included. So we're, we want to try and build a framework where people's voices can be um, added so they're building blocks and layers um, so the first question is what does our culture mean to us we've heard from various people today um, around the culture that they're imbuing in their organizations or in from their perspectives from the coal community um, disability and inclusion um, from food systems and a systems approach and regenerative approach deep listening approach uh, indigenous cultures and first nations principles so what does it mean to you? What does culture mean to you? Second one is what does a strong and vibrant culture look like? 
So we heard um, uh, it was a beautiful precept that you did, Saba, for us in that uh, in that piece. And I think I'd love to be able to circulate that document if we can um, to the group because you know listening to it from um, people who've been displaced and they've come to this culture, how do they fit in? How do we actually make an inclusive voice? What does it look like to to do that? And then. The last one is what are the principles, the frameworks or protocols that we're um, for working together? So are there some big value statements that you want to try and contribute? How do we bring this all together? What kind of framework, what visions and, and values do we want to represent as we work together to deepen the conversation? And in terms of logistics, we'll remind you when you come back, but there'll be two ways to engage. If you're online, we've got a, a one Google Doc link that we'll share with you when we come back. And all the groups um, online, we're just going to put you into a little breakout so you can have a proper chat, probably just five people, and you can have a chat about those different ideas and jot down to a, a few key points all into the same document. And if you're in the room together, you'll have the good old fashioned butcher's paper, hooray, um, haven't we missed butcher's paper through COVID? Um, and sticky Kira, notes. Yeah. And sticky notes. Sticky notes, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so look, let's let's have a break. Um, I'll, I'll in a minute, I'll put those questions back up. So if anyone in the room or online wants to look at them while you ponder your cup of tea, but let's make it, um, if we could be back by uh, quarter past and kick off again at 20 past 12 Queensland time, We'll take that extra bit of time um, at the end where we'll just have a quick feedback and no one will lose their important cup of tea break. So, Wonderful. yeah, thank you so much, Elise and Kira and everyone in the room. And thank you for your attention, everyone online. Hope to see you back here. We really do need your input. So um, please come back, even if you want to do 10 minutes of the discussion, if you have to run off to your busy day. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. You. All right. And lots of lovely conversations in the break as well. That's good. The joys of in-person gatherings. Yes, don't we love it? So um, if you're ready to go and we're ready to go, I might just run through the instructions again um, and then we can handle any questions and go forth and have a chat. Wonderful. So bear with me, ladies and gentle folk, as I share screen again. Hang on. Buttons, buttons. My life is controlled by buttons. There we go. All right, so um, thanks for your patience, folks, as we change the time a little bit, but it's all good. So what we will do, it's now 12.20. I think what we can do is um, we can still be um, fabulously efficient in an hour and 10 instead of an hour and a half. And in fact, it might be a better um, amount of time. So I'm gonna put the Google Doc link in the chat for everybody online. And then everybody online, I'm going to break you into probably only two groups today. Um, and when we get into our groups, if you could make sure that one or two people are happy to take a few notes and pop them into the Google Doc. So number one, I'll share the Google Doc with you. Number two, I'll break you into your groups. Number three, pick a scribe or someone who's happy to type some notes into the Google Doc. Um, and that's pretty much it. The rest is up to you. What we do have is those three questions. You're very welcome to work through each of the three questions and talk about them. Or if it all muddles together, that's okay too. We're very flexible. What are we gonna do with these notes? Well, what we're going to do is synthesize them a little and turn them um, the, from, we'll probably end up with four or five groups um, and bring many of the common themes together. But anyone who's participated today will have access to the raw data um, which we'll type up, and also a bit of a summary note. And each of the summary notes from each of our workshops will feed into um, a really nice process. And um, Elise and myself and Kira will be um, aiming to get them put into um, either some visual, some lovely graphics, or some kind of attractive looking report um, so that Elise can take all of our notes from the four uh, workshops off to the Social Enterprise World Forum and we'll be also using them um, as the jumping off point for a whole bunch of really deep interactive activities next year, including a few more workshops and talk fests, but also um, cultural tours, tours of our local ecosystems, tours of local enterprises and businesses, um, and really just some fun ways to get lots of folks together to have a good time. I think we should definitely include some kind of tour of local breweries. I think that would be appropriate for Regen Brisbane. Okay, so is that pretty clear? Does anyone have any questions? 
Um, once we settle everything in, I'll keep the questions up on the screen, um, I think. Kira, are there any questions or everyone's happy? Oh, you're on mute, Dom. Um, no, I think we're good to go, Michelle. All right, very good. So bear with me, ladies and gentlefolk, as I get the um, Google link from wherever I safely stashed it. Okay. So once again, and I hate to remind everyone all the time, but I know if you're new to this, it can be a bit strange. I've just put in the chat a Google Doc. Everyone online, if you could click on that link, you should be able to go in and type wherever you want. But before you type wherever you want, I'm going to turn our online folks into two uh, breakout groups. So in the meantime, Kira, you can now ignore us and carry on with your thing um, unless you need me. And we'll see if our hybrid mix actually works. Hooray. OK, so thanks, everyone, for coming back after our wonderful discussions. We've got, I think we had two groups online. Kira, did you have two or three groups in the room? Um, we had three groups. Okay, cool. Well, we look forward to hearing from um, your in the, in the room groups first. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for um, <clears throat> bearing with us. Let's do, if we do the pin. Can we do the pin thing? I just did the pin. So you might just want to rearrange how you're sharing. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Excellent. So our group did lots of sticky notes. Woo! Lots and lots of sticky notes. But some of the main points for us around um, our culture, the first um, question was around what culture means to us. Um, it's not just people we wanted to say, it's connection to the land and to place, um, that we have an obligation for renewal, that we are caretakers here. And that culture is actually dynamic and it shifts and changes with time. And we need to adapt and be agile to make sure that we're looking after the common law and um, the common areas uh, that we wanted to, to try and work with. In the second one, we uh, looked at um, what does uh, strong and vibrant culture looks like. We wanted to say that it's a, a deep knowledge of my place in this place. So we're actually looking at it from uh, a generous nature. We wanted to look at walking together with compassion. It looks like, and this was really beautiful, it looks like washing of feet. So when you wash other people's feet, you're actually in a position of service and gratitude and giving. So we wanted to also say that um, a strong and vibrant culture was a respect for everyone's stories because stories connect us all. And in the last one, we had um, a few R's. <laughs> we had, um, we, we found out that we really wanted to um, find a common ground to seek systems change, that we needed to shift to a new paradigm. And we we're gonna do that through respect. So looking at different, uh, embracing different opinions, understanding others' points of views, uh, looking at elder wisdom and First Nations voices, at resilience, the second R, learning from our mistakes, trying again and making decisions together, uh, reciprocity, so equal and shared resources, having shared value, balancing impact and income, regenerative, so looking at not just net zero, um, circular in notion, it returns as much as it gets, and from out of that came the next star, which was renewal, which is a sense of innovation, which springs up when that is in perfect balance. It springs up and gives us a sense of renewal and what's next, so innovation. And then we had our last one was broad representation. So many voices, diversity of ideas and empowering others. And then we had a whole bunch of what culture is not, which is not traditions that bind us to patriarchy. Uh, to empires, to control, to uh, single bottom lines and return on investment. That's what it's not. That was excellent. Thank you. Who's next in there in the room? I'm looking at a lovely chair at the moment. Sorry, we are just... <laughs> They're just negotiating who's going to speak. That's okay. <laughs> okay, we've got it. Hello, everybody. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hello, Steve. 
see you. Um, so the first we so we did some columns. Maybe I'll sit here. We did some columns, and so the first column was about remind me. What does culture mean to us? Is that the yeah, okay? So we we were a little bit confused, I must say, about this uh, question. So we started off just with throwing things out. So we've got the the culture for us around Southeast Queensland is about easygoing people. It's about people who are grounded and adaptable. That culture is close to the heart and lifeblood of the city and the region. That also, though, that there's a radical undercurrent to Brisbane, and that's something that Rob talked about earlier. There's this outdoor culture in South East Queensland too. Uh, oh, that should be principal. <laughs> and also recognising that in Brisbane, particularly, there's a real, there's kind of real pockets of multiculturalism, that, but there's also pockets of existing older suburbs that are completely kind of Anglo in culture and very monocultural. Now the second one, can you read out the second? What does a strong and vibrant culture look like? So we've got, oh, we've got that it's connected to land and water, that it's inclusive and everyone has a stake, that it's open and democratic, that there's a flatter power curve, there's a distribution of power, that it leans into community, embraces diversity, it's plural in nature, that it's respectful and trustful, there's a transparency in politics, that would be nice, wouldn't it? There's decision making at a local level. So Rob used the um, example of Jonathan Shree and the way that he, um, really consults with people about budgetary decisions in his ward at Brisbane City Council, that uh, we should celebrate and have fun, that there's a story vision, that it's net positive, and that there's many, many leaders in community ownership. And the third question was, Okay, so these are some of the principles and frameworks that we come up with, that we should always encourage debate and that we should recognise that that debate might take, and uh, discussion might take a really long time so that we have to be slow and patient in our decision making. That all perspectives are valid and reasonable, that came from um, Dr Mary Graham, that it's participatory, mutualist, relational and connected to place, seeks to understand that there's reciprocity, that there's a First Nations terms of reference as a principle, that we embody the principles of forgiveness, compassion and empathy. We're gentle to ourselves and others, that there's kindness embedded in our principles and there's good manners as well. And that came again from Mary Graham, that all voices are equal, that we're wise and hopeful. There's community development principles embedded in there too. There's a releasing of judgment. So not the concept of having zero judgment or no judgment, but the concept of releasing judgment of others. And that we're all setting a good example. So that's, that's our group's effort. Thank you, everyone. That was excellent. And we'll hear from the third group. Hey, great. Huzzah. Hello. Hello. Okay, so we, we focus more on this, whoops, the strong and vibrant culture. Maybe That's just, good. Um, like, everyone can see your face. <laughs> okay, so we had words like um, embracing diverse experience, critically appraising um narratives celebrating identity community and like developing community and peer support like empowering the community to support each other um uh cultivating a connection to land through belonging and um creating architecture and events that support people to have a deeper relationship with the land um having landscapes that are integrated with nature, um, 
respectfully learning and listening uh, diverse Brisbane local food water waste networks. Um, uh, acknowledging that diversity leads to thriving, um, finding your ikigai, which is this like Japanese concept of um, honing your purpose, your passion, your skills, and like, yeah, your essence. Um, cultivating creativity, creativity, passion, joy of life, and participation in each individual human being. Um, uh, commitment to relational ethos, reciprocity, respectful, inclusive, respectful inclusivity with consent, um, decentralizing power, leadership skills and cap capacity building. Uh, what else? Combined leadership styles, re-indigenizing ourselves to the earth, acknowledging that we're all indigenous to this earth and being responsible for uh, the healing that we need through our ancestry, um, and decolonizing through that. Um, learning to, yeah, learning to bring stories about our own ancestors, like learning our own stories, whatever lands we come from and, and sharing that and listening to other people's stories. Um, demonstrating intentions for the common good, um, cultivating neighborhood sharehoods and um, yeah, like share, neighborhood sharehoods and events, I've forgotten what that was exactly about. Um, Sounds good anyway. So, yes, great. <laughs> um, and then principles and the frameworks was around, um, yeah, cultivating stewardship, uh, having a collective community voice and power building, um, healing and developing, like cultivating healing and connections through a connection with your core, your community and the country and knowing that that's like a relationship. Yeah, that starts at the individual and goes out in ripples. Um, cultivating a responsibility, like through the law of obligation, like Mary Graham talks about, this ability to respond. Kinship, earth-centered mindset, um, talking circles, um, commitment to bridge building, um, accepting the offer, like having a yes and mentality to what people offer um, in, yeah, in projects and creativity building. And also like um, acknowledging the activating and restraining forces that are required to build um, creativity in, in a particular project. Like you're always going to have people that are passionate and you're always going to have people that are like, you know, wanting not quite happy with something and then really acknowledging the passion in the restraining force and the, you know, acknowledging the fear or the anger or whatever's there. And then using that as part of the engagement process in creativity and then taking it forward and finding a, a, a reconciling force there for, yeah, new creativity. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you to everyone in the room. Now, um, we've got, we had two groups online and because I was in one of them, we might go last. So, Neil, did you want to do a, a just a quick summary? We've, we've, if we could aim for covering ourselves, covering ourselves, um, covering off, you can tell it's Friday, covering off our points in about four minutes. So two minutes for you guys, two for us. That would be awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm well, you need three, Neil. We'll, you, you can have I, three. I, I'm going to nominate Fiona. Could you do that, please, Fiona? Would you be okay with that? Yeah. I think she's well across it. Oh, I, I thank you, Neil. Thank you. Um, so just in, in two minutes, and um, thanks, Michelle, for doing uh, the groups because we had a fantastic um, uh, mix of us um, and it was just a really lively conversation. So um, just, just in summary, uh, just want to say that when we talked about probably um, what culture was, um, it came to us as this, it's really about how we show up daily, how we live, and it's not something separate from even economics and that it's it's really about um, an appreciation and an integration and being respectful of what is already present 
And it's also about what we prioritize and give value to. So it's, it's sometimes we find that we have separate conversations, but when it comes to talking about the economy, suddenly nature is sort of forgotten. So we really want to put it um, about how we relate to one another and how we relate to the environment and, um, and that, that it's something that is constantly evolving. And that for us is what culture is. Um, and, then, and then also the second question in terms of creating a, um, uh, a vibrant culture is, is building on that, that it's nature first, then it's a, system, a systems approach. Um, and that really it's, it's also looking at what Brisbane offers, which is that incredible open air lifestyle, indoor, outdoor approach. Um, that was, uh, Leila was particularly mentioning that, but, and if we think also and take some inspiration from Angela's from Singapore, and she sort of looked at um, Singapore being a biophilic um, city, that really they are about creating um, an urban greening that um, example. Um, and so that, that could be something that we also look, look to. And then finally, just being conscious of time. Um, if we look to the final is, is how do we bring all these together um, and, look at um, ways of interacting and protocols, then we definitely felt, um, Michelle, that we shouldn't look too much further than the Green Prince model around donut economics. Um, and we particularly like the Green Prince approach because it really takes in the more than human view. Uh, and it also uh, addresses the fact that we are so uh, privileged to come from a country which has such um, a, a wonderful Aboriginal culture knowledge and foundation um, and that for us um, the Green Prince approach can use that and go forward and we finally just wanted to say how do we just make sure that Regen Brisbane is also integrating all the wonderful community groups and things that are being done at that level how do we actually get the word out um, and and use that so uh, anything else from our, our team to add to that Sounds great. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah, I got a thumbs up from Leila. Um, very good. Thank you. That all sounds terrific. And of course, I'm glad to hear Green Prince mentioned. I think I forgot to mention it in our group. So thank you so much. Um, with our group, I wonder um, if I can share the love. And maybe Gail, would you like to just, <laughs> she's freaked out. Did you just want to speak? Well, you're our cultural, you know, the person who spent a lot of time studying culture. Did you just want to speak to those first points? Like what is culture? Um, in the first place. You don't have to. I don't want to put you on the spot. I can do the rest fairly speedily. Oh, you're on mute, Gail. I was just trying to find our document where we were. I mean, cult culture to me, because I come from that background, is, is much more um, philosophical. It's, it's how we understand the world and how we shape the world. Um, so that will vary between different people. And we were all part of multiple cultures. And the... the um, Hopefully the boundaries between them are quite permeable so we can learn from each other's cultures and share them. Is that enough? Yes. No, I think that's lovely. That's lovely. So we looked at what is culture and um, we kind of started to talk a little bit about some of the negative aspects of what we might call mainstream culture. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to that and then I might even ask Mariel to talk very briefly about um, the strong emphasis she had in her discussions about what a positive culture looks like, particularly around design and, and long-termism. But we sort of, in our notes, we shared our concerns about consumer culturalism, um, about the colonial culture of sort of non-Indigenous or white institutionalised Australia. Um, we are still only 230 years old as a British, um, British, British designed uh, legal economic system. And we're well and truly in the throes of the neoliberal governments um, that have been in power for many decades, regardless of their flavor. So we were concerned a bit about our mainstream culture, but there's also some good things in there. Mariel, did you wanna just speak very briefly, just a minute or so about the, the importance of good design? <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, we, we touched on um, what would it look like to just consider all the stuff that's involved with particularly framed around the Olympics, whether it be the big stuff, the infrastructure, stadiums, the buildings, all the little stuff, the merch, the soft toys. And everyone's backyard is our backyard. So if we wouldn't want it in our backyard forever, then it shouldn't be in anyone's backyard forever. Um, and actually simplifying that lens of thinking about it rather than needing to have tomes and tones. 
And this idea of going after excellence rather than it'll do so much of our procurement processes are kind of what's the minimum standard, the cheapest we can get it for, which leaves us with this mediocrity everywhere, as opposed to going, what's actually the best way to do this, whether it's the athletes village or whether it's uniforms. Um, and so then if you bring that into our culture in general, then how do we do that with our public spaces? How do we do that with our civic public infrastructure that normally is scrimped while we lavish on our private? And how do we flip that to actually, I'm really happy with my house being enough, but I'd love it if the park gets more money on it because that's for everyone or the museum gets more money on it or you know all of that stuff. So really around that excellence in the collective, uh, really. And I would just say, we also talked about transparency and transparency around this term commercial and confidence that we always get fobbed off with. And I reckon we need an absolute shift and a laser smash of a floodlight over where is the money going when it's spent in our name. Mm, absolutely. Thank you, Mariel. And I just wanted to show folks in the room because you could all see each other as you worked. When we were working, we had our little, um, so group one was us and group two was um, Neil and, and his colleagues. And so the notes from our groups are about what is culture? What does a strong and vibrant culture look like? All of these notes are there and we'll share the raw version of everything with all of you but we'll also do a bit of a summary so that people can see it. Um, and certainly in terms of um, the positive stuff around building a culture that um, can be vibrant and support lively ecosystems and human cultures, we had uh, lots of great ideas. And in particular, this sort of focus on the, particularly for, um, I guess, Elisa's purposes of bringing ideas together around thinking about the Olympics heading our way. Um, our group was very strong. We have the view that the proposal to develop a community or people's white paper, which was talked about at the Olympics webinar is worth pursuing. And we're all keen to in, uh, input to that. And certainly yes, building with indigenous principles, ensuring that we focus on what will the place look like five years after the Olympics are finished to help us make decisions that are good for everyone. Um, and some great questions about how do we challenge the establishment, challenge um, the lack of transparency and commercial decisions about the infrastructure coming into our community. Um, and in terms of rules, we did touch on them. Um, um, Mariel had some great rules about, you know, how do we make sure that there's actually an idea of community shareholding of any of the new assets and developments so that things will come back to communities um, when they're after they've been used. So, so there's a lot of really big picture issues in there. And um, that's all very good. So look, I just want to thank all of you. I know we've been a small but mighty group today, but I think we've done some really cool stuff. And um, I am now going to pin myself and pin Kira's space because that's Kira and Elise. And um, I'm a great believer in ending on time, if not a little earlier to give people hope that they will have their Friday afternoon. So let's do a very quick wrap up. I might do a little bit of housekeeping um, and then Kira and Elise can finish up too. So. What I did want to do um, was do a big, big thank you to all of you, as I said, for your time. We're very grateful to you. Um, these four workshops, this first date was relatively short notice. So we're really very, very delighted that you could be with us. And I just wanted to share screen so that everyone can see how to stay in touch. If you're not already um, connected to Regen Brisbane, um, there's the website, which I showed you, the beautiful website. The, every event we run will go up there so that you can book your tickets, but also afterwards any recordings will be shared. Um, the main email address to find us is info at regenbrisbane.net.au. The lovely Kira is keeping an eye on emails, but we're all there with you. We also have a Facebook page um, and we hope that you will connect with that. And what I did want to just roll backwards here and remind you all, um, I thought I had it here somewhere, please hold up. Ah. So our next webinar, or sorry, our next workshop in this series is the 29th of July, slightly different time due to the availability of the room, 12 noon to 4 p.m. We hope that you will um, come together and we'll be talking about society. And then on the 19th of August, we'll be talking about the environment. And last but not least, of course, on the 2nd of September, we'll be focusing on the economy. Um, but before the uh, 29th of July, you will be emailed um, some notes from today and the beginnings of pulling together um, some creative ways to share all these ideas. Um, our, my only ask would be if you know anyone, um, there's a really important question before um, about how we bring all the groups in Brisbane together to do this. 
we will be actively inviting everyone we can think of to the workshop series, but also to a whole range of cool events next year. So if you have any friends or colleagues, please tell them about this workshop series. Um, at the very least, flick them the website, um, invite them to email us if they want to know more. But it's a really, we really hope that our the next three workshops will be an even bigger show so we can bring more and more folks together. So we want as many voices as possible to come in to talk about the um, beyond 2032, the Olympics vision, but also more long-term about Brisbane and its future. So that's probably enough from me. Over to you, Elise. Um, just wanted to say again, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, uh, Queensland Social Enterprise Council is very excited to be bringing this to the Social Enterprise World Forum on the 28th and 29th in Brisbane. At the Convention Centre, there's more of that information on our website, as well as the Social Enterprise World Forum's website. Um, and we'll have a, a graphic illustrator there actually bringing all of these things to life in time, in space, during the, the actual um, uh, conference. So it's gonna be super exciting. All of your voices will be um, synergized at that point. So thanks once again, um, and thank you to everybody here too. Well, thank you everyone. Any questions, get in touch. Otherwise, have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Thank you everybody. Thank you, bye. Bye.